Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this edition of Studying with Brother Don. And I'm Brother Don, and it's good to have you here with me in Bible Study Central. And uh, we're going to be looking at uh, what I had intended to look at last week, but we got sidetracked on some of the news. And tonight, I'm not going to do some news. There's there's a couple of things that would I think would be of interest, but I'm not going to... Uh, uh, get into them tonight because I want to take the time to uh, do this study that we're going to look at. And as I said last week, we're going to be talking about the rapture, the pre-trib rapture, proof from the scripture that the rapture will happen and it will happen before the tribulation, at least the way I read scripture and understand it. And what we're going to look at tonight is First and Second Thessalonians. And these are Paul's probably two most important prophetic writings that he gives us. And I can't, well, let me say it like this. After we go through this study, I, I don't think you'll be able to see it any other way but then a pre-trib rapture because of what he's going to teach and what is taking place in Thessalonica when he writes these two letters to them. So that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to study God's word and seek his truth. And so before we do, let's let's have a, a prayer and seek the Lord's guidance, and then we'll get into the truth of scripture tonight. So Heavenly Father, Lord, we stand before you tonight asking for your grace. And Father, I pray that you would just lead us. Father, that you would teach us by your Holy Spirit, through your word, your truth. And Father, just help us not only to have this as knowledge, but Father, that it change our lives, that it become a seed in our hearts and in our spirits, and that it bears fruit through our lives, that number one, we may be changed into your glory, and number two, Father, that people around us might be saved as we share with them the truth of your word. Let it be so, Father. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, First and Second Thessalonians and the pre-trib rapture are, are one biblical proof. And this is not all. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, the Bible teaches pre-trib rapture from the book of Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation. And, and I could show you just passage after passage. And I have a couple of teachings on my YouTube channel if you want to go back and look at them, either under the prophetic studies or under studying with Brother Don under those playlists, and you can find those teachings. And I'll probably do some more later on as, as we go along in time, looking for and waiting for the Lord to come and to take us home. But we want to look at First and Second Thessalonians tonight. And to set the stage for this, I want to go back to Acts chapter 17 first. And I want to read in beginning in verse 1 through verse 9, when Paul first went to Thessalonia and, and what happened there. And that's going to set the stage for what we're going to see in First and Second Thessalonians. So beginning in Acts chapter 1, beginning at Acts chapter 17, beginning in verse 1, the scripture says this, And after they passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. And as usual, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Messiah to suffer and raise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you as the Messiah. Some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, including a large number of God-fearing Greeks, as well as a number of the leading women. But the Jews became jealous, and they brought together some wicked men from the marketplace. They formed a mob and started a riot in the city. Attacking Jason's house, they searched for them, to bring out to the public assembly. And when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city officials and shouting, these men have turned the world upside down, have come here too. And Jason has welcomed them. They accused them that they were acting contrary to Caesar's decree, saying that there is another king, Jesus. 
And the crowd and city officials who heard these things were upset. And after taking a security bond from Jason and the others, they released them. So that's the background of what happened in Thessalonica and what started. So we learned a couple of things from this. Number one, we learned that first of all, Paul was only in Thessalonica about three weeks. It says that he was there for three Sabbath days, reasoned with them from the scriptures. And then later on, we didn't read that far down, but later on, they had to pretty much just get him out of the city because there was so much persecution, so much turmoil because of him coming there and what he was preaching. So apparently three weeks is about it. And so in those three weeks, these new converts, Paul had to teach them a lot. And we're going to see that, that he sent Timothy to help them and, and, and some others possibly, but that's not much time. And so he had to teach them a whole lot in a short period of time. And so that could partially have led to their confusion. The second thing that we see is that for almost from the very beginning, there was persecution. And so look at some of the words that they used. They talked about riots. They talked about that there were wicked men that, that came out against them. And, and they attacked Jason's house, it says in verse 5. So some of these words, this is not just your everyday average, you know, I, I disagree with what you're saying. You know, I don't want nothing to do with you. This is more than that, that they were attacking them. They were rioting because of those that were being saved. So those in Thessalonica, when they accepted Christ, they accepted Christ under heavy persecution, okay? So that brings us now to 1 Thessalonians. And we're not going to read the whole of the two books of First and Second Thessalonians, but we're going to look at quite a bit of it, and we are going to read some of the passages, okay? So first of all, in chapter 1, he says, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. In verse 2, he says, we always thank God for all of you making mention of you constantly in our prayers. And so that, that, that's pretty powerful to me, uh, to think that Paul, Silas, Timothy had come to them and preached the gospel. And then after they had left with this, this young church there, Paul says, man, every day he says, I pray for you. I never forget to mention you in my prayers. As a matter of fact, he says, making mention of you constantly in my prayers. So Paul had a great heart for these people and he loved them and he wanted them to be secure in their salvation and grow. Now drop down to verse six and notice what he says here. In verse six of chapter one, he says, and you yourselves became imitators of us and of the Lord when in spite of severe persecution, you welcome the message with joy from the Holy Spirit. So notice that from the get-go, from the moment that they, Paul got there and started preaching the gospel and they started responding to the gospel, Paul says that it was in spite of severe persecution that you received the Lord Jesus Christ. So this was not something that came up later. It, it was from the very beginning that they suffered persecution because of their faith in Jesus Christ. And again, notice the word, severe. He said, you suffered severe persecution. But now drop down to verse 10 and look at the promise that he gives him because this is going to be very important. He says in verse 10, he says, and to wait, well, verse 9, for they themselves report what kind of reception we had from you, how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and the true God, and, verse 10, to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Okay, so to me, now that's, that's our first indication about the pre-trib rapture. Paul tells them, look, he said, you accepted Jesus Christ in severe persecution and it's still going on. But he says, you need to understand that this is not the wrath of God. 
because we are going to be saved. We're going to be rescued from the wrath that's coming. So that leads us or brings us up to this question. What is the wrath that he is talking about that is coming? What is the wrath to come? Would it be the tribulation period or would it be hell? Or, or would it be God's judgment in some other form? What is he talking about when he says that Jesus Christ, who rescues us from the wrath to come? Well, first of all, I want you to look at a couple of other places where this word is used and the way it's used. And in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 6, listen to what Paul says. He says, Let no one deceive you with empty arguments, for God's wrath is coming on the disobedient because of these things, sin. Romans chapter 1, God says, or Paul says, that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against those who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So there is a sense that the wrath of God is God's judgment on sin. And we could say in general. God's judgment on sin in general, but according to Ephesians chapter 5, there is also that sense that God's wrath is coming on the disobedient because of these things. God's wrath is not necessarily here, or a specific type of God's wrath is not here yet, but it is coming, okay? And the argument could be made that he's talking about hell and not the tribulation, okay? And we'll deal with that. And then in Revelation chapter 6 and verse 16, the writer there tells us about those that are now going through the, the seal judgments during the first half of the tribulation. And he says, And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of the one seated on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. So in that sense, the wrath that he's talking about that is coming is the wrath of God in judgment, Jesus Christ in judgment during the tribulation period. Okay, I think that that's what Paul's talking about when he says Jesus who rescues us from the coming wrath I think he's talking about the tribulation period. And here's why. We, as born-again children of God, that's the Thessalonians, these that are the, the new believers in this new church at Thessalonica, we don't have to worry about hell. And even though hell is a form of God's wrath and God's judgment, upon unbelievers, it's not something that we have to worry about, and it's not something that, that somebody has to come back and remind us with a promise that, look, you're not, you know, you've been rescued from that wrath, because we know we have. That was settled on the cross, and that was settled when we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Romans chapter 8 verse 1 tells us that there is therefore now no condemnation to those who were in Christ Jesus. So you see, for me, for you, for children of God, that's a settled issue. So there's no need for the apostles to write us letters and, and keep on telling us, look, you've been saved from hell. You've been saved from the wrath that's coming in the form of eternal judgment because we know that. Even Jesus said in John chapter 5, truly I tell you, anyone who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life and will not come under judgment, but is passed from death to life. So we know that. This wrath that Paul is telling us, he says, we are to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who rescues us from the coming wrath is not hell. That's already settled. So the only other thing that it could be is God's wrath poured out on this world in judgment, and that would be the seven-year tribulation period. That's the only thing that, that 
Paul could be referencing. Now, if you don't believe in the seven-year tribulation period, as, as a lot of people believe that all prophecy, even the book of Revelation, was all fulfilled at an earlier date, and there is really no future prophecy for us, just, the, just Jesus coming one day, then all of this is moot because you, you have nothing to look forward to. Paul is writing this letter to people, as we're going to see in just a minute, who distinctly think that they have missed the resurrection of the saints, the rapture, and they are now in the tribulation period. That's what they think. They think that because, as we saw, and we're going to see more and more, the persecution on them was so great and false prophets and false teachers had come in in the church and had told them, look, you've missed the resurrection. You are now in the tribulation. This is the wrath of God. And they believed them, or at least they were confused. Remember, Paul was only there for three weeks, and so he probably didn't have time to really get deep into these teachings. And so they were confused. And so Paul writes them back and he says, look, you're going to be rescued from the wrath to come. And as we can see from the scriptures, that has to be the tribulation period. It's not hell that he's talking about here. And then in chapter 2 and in verse 2, he points out again, he says, on the contrary, after we had previously suffered, we were treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know, we were emboldened by our God to speak the gospel of God to you in great, in spite of great opposition. So again, he points out the persecution they were under, the struggles, the tribulation. Yes, use that word, the tribulation that they were going through. And it was upsetting them as, yeah, I'm sure it would. Nobody wants to go through tribulation and suffering. Now, when I use the word tribulation right there in that way, I'm not talking about the tribulation. I'm talking about tribulation that we all face and go through in this world. Drop down to verse 14. He says, For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of God's churches in Christ Jesus that are in Judea, since you have also suffered the same things from your people of your own country, just as they did from the Jews, they who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and persecuted us. So again, Paul points out the persecution and the severity of it. Great persecution that they were going under. Now, drop down to chapter 3 and look at verses 1 through 4. And this is where, after Paul had been there and had left, he sent Timothy back because he was concerned about the saints there in Thessalonica, beginning in verse 1 of chapter 3. He says, Therefore, when we could no longer stand it, we thought it was better to be left alone in Athens, and we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you concerning your faith. And notice what he says, So that no one will be shaken by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are appointed for this. In fact, verse 4, when we were with you, we told you in advance that we are going to experience affliction. And as you know, it happened. And for this reason, when I could no longer stand it, I also sent him to know, to find out about your faith, fearing that the tempter had tempted you and that our labor might be for nothing. So Paul had sent Timothy back to encourage them and, and to teach them again the truths of God's word. So apparently there had already been some correspondence between Paul and the church at Thessalonica. Apparently they had either written him a letter or sent him a word telling him what was happening to them, explaining to him the persecution that they were going through and letting him know that this was causing some problems. We're a little bit confused about what's going on. And, and as we're going to see, in, especially in Second Thessalonians, there were some other problems that had 
arisen because of the false teaching and the concern they were having. And it all goes back to the amount of persecution, the afflictions that they were under. Remember what he said in verse 3, so that no one will be shaken by these afflictions. And he says, for you yourselves know that I, I told you this was going to happen. I warned you in advance. And so as he's teaching them, he reminds them that, look, the wrath of God is coming. But before it comes, we as the church are going to suffer persecution, affliction, tribulations. We're going to go through these difficult things. But then if you'll drop down to chapter four, beginning in verse 13, he reminds them of the great getting up morning, the rapture passage. This is the the famous passage that we all love so much. Chapter four, beginning in verse 13, he says, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, concerning those who are asleep so that you will not grieve like the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again in the same way through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For we say this to you by the word of the Lord, we who are still alive at the Lord's coming will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the archangel's voice, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are still alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. And, and what a passage. I mean, I, I love to read this and I love to think about the day that, that I'm going to be doing my business and I'm going to hear a, a trumpet sound. Then I'm going to hear the voice of the archangel and the command of the Lord. And I think as Revelation chapter 4 says, when John was called up in the spirit to heaven, he's going to say, come up here. And we that are children of God are going to be caught up. And where does it say we're going to meet him? Does it say that we're going to go and then come back to earth? It, no, we're going to meet him in the air. Jesus has not said in this passage to come back to earth. It's like with John chapter 14, verse one and two, Jesus says, let not you believe in God, believe also in me. He said, in my father's house are many mansions and if it were not so, I would have told you and I go and I prepare a place for you and I will come again and take you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. Okay, well, that's what Jesus is saying here. Paul is saying here, he's saying that when we are still alive and who are left, we'll be caught up together with the resurrected saints to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. So where is that? Jesus said again in John 14, he said, I'm going to take you where I am so that you may be there also. Well, folks, right now, Jesus is in heaven. And at the time of all of this, even during the time of the tribulation, Jesus is going to be in heaven. So are we, because we will be caught up with him and we will be in heaven. Notice again, these passages do not teach that Jesus will come back to earth at this time at the time when the, the saved are resurrected and caught up to be with him. Compare Zechariah chapter 14, chapter 12, 13, and 14. At that time, the Bible specifically says at the second coming that Jesus will physically come back to earth. Physically, he will put his feet on earth and he will fight as in the day of battle but in these passages, it says we will meet him in the air and we will go to be with him 
where he is. So Paul reminds them of this, of what he told them. And, and uh, if you drop down to chapter five and verse one through nine now, this is going to be a, a telltale teaching. This is one of those passages that we really need to pay attention to and see what he is teaching us. So beginning in chapter five, verse one, he says about the times and the seasons, brothers and sisters, you do not need anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. When they say peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them like labor pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in the dark for this day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then let us not sleep like the rest, but let us stay awake and be self-controlled. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled and put on the armor of faith and love and a helmet of the hope of salvation, verse 9, for God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And again, I'm going to say, what a passage. And, and the truth that he teaches us here, he begins by saying, look, he said, we, we don't need to teach you because we've already told you all of this. But since you are having questions and you're facing so much persecution and problems are happening, he said, I'm going to tell you about all this again. And when you read this passage, one of the main things that you need to notice is the way that he uses the words you and us as opposed to they and them, okay? Watch that closely. He says this, he says, for you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. And we say, yeah, we know that. But watch what he says. He says, when they say peace and security, when they say peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them and they will not escape. Okay, when he's already told us two times, one time in this passage and one back in, in chapter one, that we will be rescued from the wrath to come. And now he's telling us that they will not escape, that sudden destruction, wrath, judgment will come upon them. And how will it come upon them? Like a thief in the night. Because they are not looking for Christ. They have rejected Jesus Christ and his salvation. But he says, for you are all children of light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then let us not sleep like the rest, but let us stay awake and self-controlled. Why? Because of verse four. But you brothers and sisters are not in the dark for this day to surprise you like a thief. Now think about the Thessalonians. They got saved under the Apostle Paul's teaching and under great persecution. They're moving forward in their life. Paul has to leave. Persecution continues. Things are, are probably getting worse by the day. Roman persecution, Jewish persecution, Gentile persecution, because Gentiles don't like Christ either. And then some smooth tog, smooth tongued devil masquerading as a minister of righteousness comes to town and he says, oh guys, he says, y'all are in the tribulation. You didn't know that? You, you've missed the resurrection and now you are experiencing the wrath of God. 
And Paul says, now, wait a minute. He says, you brothers and sisters. He said, you are not in the dark for this day to surprise you like a thief. Folks, the tribulation period, number one, we're not going to go through it. And number two, it's not going to sneak upon us like a thief in the night. Why not? Because we have the word of God. We know the teachings of God, and more important than that, we are looking for Christ. Remember what Jesus said? Jesus said if the man of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, that he, he would have stayed awake and he wouldn't let the thief break in. That's they. We know the thief is coming. And in this case, the thief would be the judgment of God, the tribulation period. We know it's coming. And so what are we doing? We're not looking for the tribulation. We're looking for Jesus who rescues us from the wrath to come. Do you see what Paul's telling them here? And so he says, so then don't sleep like the rest, but stay awake and be self-controlled for... Verse 9, God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, listen, in both of these passages, chapter 4, verse 13 through 18, the great resurrection passage, he ends the passage in verse 18 by saying, therefore, encourage one another with these words. And then in this passage that we just read, chapter 5, verses 1 through 9, he ends the passage in verse 11 by saying, therefore, encourage one another and build each other up as you were doing already. Now, folks, how could we take comfort in a passage where we were being told, okay, guys, get ready for the tribulation. Get ready for the wrath. The judgment of God is coming and you're going to go through it. I need you to go out and I need you to buy all the ammunition you can get. I need you to start storing up all the food and the water you can get. I need you to do, how are you going to take comfort in that? How is that going to bring comfort to anybody? Well, folks, the obvious answer is it's not. But the message that Paul is preaching, that we are not appointed to the wrath, we will be rescued from the wrath by Jesus Christ when he comes back to get us, that's going to bring great comfort. Man, I can, I can sit here now and I can, I can see the world going to hell. I can see the world being controlled by the God, little g, of this age. I can see the spirit of Antichrist at work in this world and the stage being set for the Antichrist. But I can be comforted because I know before the wrath of God comes. I will be rescued. That's what First and Second Thessalonians is all about. When you go back through First Thessalonians and you read the, the five chapters there of First Thessalonians, you'll notice that every one of the chapters ends with a reference to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, not a warning about the wrath and the tribulation. Don't you think if we were going to go through the tribulation period? Don't you think if the church was going to endure the wrath of God that we would be told, we would be warned? But we're not. Nowhere in Scripture are we told or warned to go through the wrath of God. We are always told to look for the return of Christ. We are told that we will escape the coming judgment, that, that there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. And when you read again these five chapters, all five of them end with a reference to the second to the coming of the not the second coming, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. In chapter one, in verse ten, he says, And to wait for his son from heaven. Who, raised, who he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. In chapter 2, look at verse 19. He says, For who is our hope 
our joy, our crown of boasting in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? In chapter 3, if you would, look at verse um, uh, 13. He says, May he make your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. And then chapter 4, of course, you have verse 13 through 18, what we just read a few minutes ago, the great getting up passage, the resurrection passage. And then in chapter 5, you have verse 23, and he says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not even a hint at preparing for the tribulation. Not even a hint at preparing for the wrath of God. As a matter of fact, Paul tells them, he says, this is not the wrath of God. This is persecution. And then in 2 Thessalonians, he tells them what to look for so that they will know that it is time for the rapture because the wrath of God is coming. Now, again, the problem was is that false prophets and false teachers who denied the return of the Lord for his church had come into the church. And they had begun to tell them, as we're going to see, that they had missed the rapture, the resurrection, and they were in the judgment of God. Look, if you would, in 2 Thessalonians now, chapter 1 and verse 4. He says, Therefore we ourselves boast about you among God's churches, about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and afflictions that you are enduring. So Paul doesn't deny that they are suffering. He's just telling them that this is not the wrath of God. This is just affliction that we as Christians, and he said, we told you this was going to happen. We're enduring this, but this is not the wrath of God. Look, if you would, now at verse 6 in chapter 1, he says, since it is, a just, since it is just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give you relief who are afflicted along with us. Now watch what he says. This will take place at the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ from heaven with his powerful angels when he takes vengeance with flaming fire on those who don't know God and on those who don't obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will pay the penalty of eternal destruction from the Lord's presence and from his glorious strength on the day when he comes to be glorified by his saints, and to be marveled at by all those who have believed because our testimony among you was believed. So he tells him, he says, look, you're being persecuted. The wrath of the Lord hasn't come yet. But he says, those that are persecuting you, those that have rejected Jesus Christ, they will be judged. First of all, they're going to go through the tribulation, the wrath of God, and then what he's talking about here at the second coming of Christ, at the revelation, he says in verse 7, of the Lord Jesus from heaven with his powerful angels, he's going to take vengeance on all of them with flaming fire. Now, what you'll notice through this passage that we just read is we're not mentioned. The only way we're mentioned is that the Lord's going to avenge us. But we're not mentioned as being here. We're not mentioned as being a part of this vengeance, this flaming fire, this penalty of eternal destruction. We're not mentioned in any of that. Why? Because we've been raptured out. And when he comes back, we'll be with him, not here facing all of this tribulation. Compare, if you would, we'll look down here in chapter 2 now, Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and verses 1 and 2. He says, Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, the rapture, we ask you, brothers and sisters, 
not to be easily upset or troubled either by a prophecy or by a message or by a letter supposedly from us alleging that the day of the Lord has come. So here Paul spells it out. Here's the problem. They had either received a, a, a letter, a prophecy, or a message supposedly from Paul saying that the day of the Lord, God's judgment, the day of Jesus had already come. Now, the day of the Lord, the day of Christ, that tribulation period, remember we read about it in Revelation just a while ago, chapter 6, where they cried out to the mountains and the rocks, fall on them and save them from the wrath of the Lamb, the judgment of God, the judgment of Jesus Christ on all of those who rejected him. Okay, he says, look, he says, don't let anybody tell you that that's happened because he said it's not happened yet. You are not in the tribulation. And this is not the only time or the only problem that this happened. Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 18, talking about some others, he said, they have departed from the truth saying that the resurrection has already taken place and are ruining the faith of some. So he had to deal with this more than once. Because of the persecution that they were going through, they thought, because of false teachers, that they were in the tribulation. They were experiencing the wrath of God. And Paul says, no. He says, the day of the Lord has not come yet. Verse 3, he says, don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless. And so now he's going to give them two signs. And he says, these are things that are going to signal that the day of the Lord has started. The wrath of the lamb has started. One of them is the great apostasy. And the second is the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. So Paul says, look, I know that you're going through some serious tribulation. And remember, he never for once denied that they were going through serious tribulation. Okay, he never denied that. But what he wants them to understand is that no matter how bad their persecution gets, no matter how bad the tribulation they are in, they are not in the tribulation. They have not missed the resurrection and therefore are in the seven years of God's wrath being poured out upon this earth. That's what he's telling them. And he says, look, he says, if, if you see the great apostasy and if you see the, the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist revealed, he said, that's the tribulation. But he says, you won't see that because that's coming upon those who have, read on down to verse 9, 10, 11, and 12, that's coming upon those who have rejected the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. But you, brothers and sisters, we brothers and sisters, are not a part of they. We are a part of the body of Christ. We will not be here. Now, just a little bit more to show you the, uh, uh, to further the understanding that they thought that there was going to be a rapture before the tribulation, drop down to chapter 3. And look at verses 6 through 12. And so Paul says here, he says, Now we command you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to keep away from every brother and sister who is idle and does not live according to the tradition received from us. For you yourselves know how you should imitate us, and we were not idle among you. Now he's talking about working, okay? Okay. And he's saying, we worked while we were there. There are others that are there now. They, they quit working. And he says, we did not eat, verse 8, we did not eat anyone's food free of charge. Instead, we labored and toiled, working night and day so that we would not be a burden to any of you. And it is, it is not that we don't have the right to support, but we did it 
to make ourselves an example to you so that you would imitate us. In fact, when we were with you, this is what we commanded. If anyone isn't willing to work, he should not eat. For we hear, and here he goes, for we hear that there are some among you who are idle. They are not busy, but busybodies. Now we command and exhort such people by the Lord Jesus Christ to work quietly and to provide for themselves. But as for you, brothers and sisters, do not grow weary in doing good. So not only did they have the problem of the persecution, the, 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 the amount of the severe affliction that they were going under and the false teachers telling them that they had missed the resurrection and now they were in the tribulation period, but they had some that had quit working. And so apparently what had happened, taking the two books as a whole, they thought that the return of Christ, the rapture of the church was so close they didn't need to work anymore. They were looking for it today. Apparently, Paul had taught them enough that it excited them. And so they had quit working, probably given away everything, and now they were having to go about begging for food. And Paul said, no, he said, you need to work. He said, you work right. You, you, you should be working when the Lord calls you home. When you hear that trumpet sound, if it's during the day, you should be working. You see, they thought these people in First and Second Thessalonians, they thought that they would be raptured out before the wrath of God. I don't see any other way you can read First and Second Thessalonians and not come to that conclusion. Everything about it points to a pre-tribulation rapture. And so, based on this and, and many, many other scriptures, that's why I'm what's called a pre-trib. I believe the church is going to be raptured out of this world before the tribulation starts. And I believe that's God's promise to us. Now, it's not all, as I said at the beginning, it's not all based on First and Second Thessalonians. It's based on a lot of things, and most of it, is based on, most of my belief in a pre-trib rapture is based on the Bible's teachings about Israel. It has nothing to do with the church. It's about Israel. I've taught on that in the past, and yes, I'll teach on it again in the future because I love teaching on these truths of God. But for tonight, comfort yourself, because that's what Paul told us to do twice. He said, therefore, comfort one another with these words. According to Paul in First and Second Thessalonians, according to Jesus in John chapter 14, verse 1, 2, and 3, we will not go through the tribulation period. We will be rescued from the wrath that is to come. Amen? Amen. If you have any questions, and, and usually there, there are questions when this kind of teaching is done, uh, leave them down in the comments, either on YouTube or Facebook, or if you want to, email me, don.chumley at gmail.com, and, and I will answer. I'll, I'll get back to you, and I'll do my best to answer your questions. So otherwise, let's encourage each other, and as the book of Hebrews says, and all the more, as you see the day approaching, let us encourage each other because, yes, we are going to go through persecution. We are going to go through severe affliction but we've been saved from the wrath to come. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. God bless you. I'll see you next week.